This is Let's Be Clear with Shannon Doherty. Hi, guys. This is Let's Be Clear with Shannon Doherty. And today I have on what's probably my absolute favorite ex-boyfriend of all time, uh, Rob Weiss. That's very sweet. Thank you. It's true, though. You're my favorite. Really? Yeah. I always say that you were like the one person I dated that was truly a good guy and smart and funny and talented, creative. You inspired me a lot. And we were together for a friggin' long time, seven and a half years. Yeah. Um, I yeah. think every decade it goes up another half year we were together. <laughs> I think like the, 10 no, years from now, like, we were together eight years, you know? No. Um, well, you know, I feel the same way about you. It's, it's kind of crazy, um, you know, that so much time has passed and how young we were and, you know, we were like, like kids. We were kids. Yeah, I mean, you know, how many real relationships does somebody get in their lifetime, you know? I mean, I mean, I've had a handful. You've had a handful. They're obviously big chapters, you know, and, and each one of those chapters teaches you something about life. Sometimes yeah. good, sometimes bad, but, you know. So. Yeah, but you were the one that, I don't know, like, even my parents liked you. Sometimes. Most of the time. Yeah, they were, they were dope. I yeah. love them, but, you know, like... They were as happy as you were happy. You know what I mean? Like, if you were kind of like, I'm out of here, they were carrying the boxes, you know? That's true. So, but I always, like, your dad, your mom's mom's a little more like, if I remember correctly, she was more like the mama bear tiger. Mm -hmm. She was quicker to be like that. Your dad was always chill. Yes. Like, I always had a good vibe with Tom. He, he was a solid cat. He, he had a good soul, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, I'm going to try to get you to cry, like, five minutes into your own podcast. Don't. I won't do it today. Um, yeah, my mom, definitely Mama Bear. But also, do you remember when we, like, my mom and I came, we painted the house? Of course. Like, what she do you mean? loved like, doing, yeah. like, she, cause yeah. she lo- and, and she wanted to see your, yeah. you know, reaction, and she was excited. Yeah. You guys got along really well. No, I, I really appreciate Rosa. You know, I, she's a really, really strong person given all the things she's been through. You know what I mean? She a lot heaped on. So have you, you know, you, you, you come from a very strong stock of people. Yeah. You know, and I, I don't think people, I think people know, like, people always knew you were strong, you were super vocal, tough, but I don't think they, necessarily understood the fortitude you know what i mean and and how good you guys are at obstacles so we are pretty good at obstacles yeah. um we'll either jump over it or just plow straight through it yeah regardless yeah. of how much we get hurt i don't know the older that. i get i'm just like i just want to fucking ignore it you know what i mean i'm like <laughs> wait what i didn't even see that and I, I didn't notice that it was happening you know? yeah i don't know i think i'm now way more aware of everything like with yeah. age and yeah. but I but I avoid the obstacles instead of plowing through. Yeah, them. same thing. Yeah, it's like, just what's the point? Yeah, it's just how much conflict can one person deal with? You know, it's like I mean, I guess a lot. A lot. Know? Yeah, a lot. Um, so I think we met in '94. I want to say. Well, it's kind of crazy actually because that's not fully accurate. '93. So it's it's kind of. It's a little bit more like, I want to say, kind of like fortuitous, like cosmic-y. Because I came out on vacation in the early 90s, like 91. It had to be like 91. And again, I was very young. I was like 14 or 12, whatever it was. No, I wasn't really. You were 14 or 12. (laughs) But I was at bar one. And I was there with a group of guys. And I met you. And we had this vibe. And I and at the time, 90210 had just started airing. I knew who you were. You know, I went back home. I was like watching that shit. I'm like, yeah, that was my girl from Ball One. You know, we had a little vibe. Then I made Amongst Friends, which was, you know, I was already in the process of wanting to to go into the film business. So I, I'd been studying film at Parsons. So I already knew I was going to do that. But I think that particular trip in general and the the culture of LA at that time and the business and the people I met was really inspiring to me, present company included. 
And then I made the movie, went to Sundance, was like successful, moved to LA. And then you knew people I knew, people I don't really mention anymore, but you knew people I knew. And somehow you were like, you said to that person, like, oh, you know that guy who made that movie? And they were like, yeah, that's the guy you met at Bar One like two years ago. You had met, you were married at the time. And then we just kind of started to see each other around, you know what I mean? I think, and that was around probably 94. And then, yeah, we started dating. So Yeah. So what I remember is... I mean, dating back then was different, by the way. And if we're going to call it out, we should call it out. Dating back then was like, you went and hung out with somebody. If you liked them, you were just like in a thing, you know? Immediately. I mean? which is yeah, like, it was just like, cool, I'm going to go get my shit. I'll be back here and I'll just live here, you know, or vice versa. Right, That's which is like basically what happened LA. with yeah. us. I mean, it yeah. was... Yeah, you know, like I left the first husband and we'd been, I guess, separated for, I don't know, a couple of months or six months, something like that. And our, you know, at that time, mutual friend yeah. brought, you came over yes, you had, to my right, house on right, you got, Exactly. You guys had like, I remember just drinking like, you know, I was back then I drank, obviously, you know, I, mean, I was like 25 or something. I think we were drinking Jack Daniels, probably playing yes. like. You were Drinking Jack Daniels games. guy. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah. yeah, and we yeah we hooked up and stayed together for ten years. <laughs> yeah, it was like nine and a half years. It was a nine and a half year relationship. It was seven and a half years that we were together, though. No, it was definitely seven years. Um, because you were only like twenty two at the time. It was right before your twenty third birthday. So, and I'm four years old. So I was twenty six. Yeah, it was like twenty three, twenty seven was our age thing, and I think we were. We did that until our thirties or something, or my thirties. Yeah. Yeah. Was a heavy duty seven years, man. I mean, that's a long. I think for for that time period, with me on nine hundred two one zero, then getting fired from nine hundred two one zero, and dealing with that feeling. Yeah. You coming out with monks friends and having a you know bungalow at universal and yeah that i never went to never i was went riddled to. with insecurity i had so much fear i couldn't pull a trigger on another thing like if i didn't go to therapy i wouldn't be in this business now like if i didn't like get to the bottom of my sh you know i think like the two of us were just like hiding out together for a while you know i think we were although i you wrote milk bar while we were together. No, yeah, I wasn't like, and I, I was, wasn't out of the like, business. Yeah, right. but I, I just remember no how bar, right. proud I was of you because yeah, it was thanks. so good. I was like, this yeah, we, really you know what's good. crazy is we still talk about that project because now it'd be just an epic period piece. But yes. I, I was functional. I don't mean to imply that like, like I was like withdrawing from the business, but I think I, I just was having such a hard time acclimating to not being a failure. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I wouldn't say I was like a super successful guy, but I definitely wasn't the failure that I felt like I was three years before. So for me, that was a pretty seismic adjustment to go through. So yeah, but I wrote Milk Bar and I wrote that while I was with you. And I think I was involved in the Iceberg Slim thing. Iceberg we Slim, together, yes, which I love. couple shows. Like, I was active. You were but in the Brett Easton Ellis thing. I was going to do American Psycho. Yeah. That's right. Um, yeah, I mean, it was, it, was, it was a great period in the business. I mean, obviously, you know, there were a lot of things about the business that weren't great also, which we've seen over the last 20 years that people yeah. have dissected and taken apart. But um, creatively, it felt like a, a, a pretty inspiring time, you know? Right, and being that young... That might have factored into it also. Maybe it's less about the period of creating in the 90s, but maybe not because I felt like even when you went and did the Kevin Smith thing and right. how excited I was, I was like, oh, you should do it. And I think we watched Clerks together. And it was like people were inspired, like indies were just starting to really crank up. Um, Sundance was new. You know what I mean? That kind of festival vibe. You yeah. Know? I mean, we went to the, what, the Spirit Awards together. We did. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And you were the one who introduced me to the whole like independent film world thing. You were like, yeah. listen, it doesn't matter if you got fired off. Nine they didn't like go me do, like, anyway cool. there because like, <laughs> I, I just fell between a crack, man. That movie was like my mashup of like 90210 meets Goodfellas, right? So it was like pretty kids in Long Island acting like gangsters. So indie purists, even though it was a super indie film, it had commercial sensibility. So... Indie people were probably like, nah, f this guy. He's not, he's not an artist or he's not high art enough. And commercial world, the commercial world was more apt to 
accept me into it, but I wanted to be, you know, artsy, I think, yeah. you know? So henceforth, how we wound up at that Spirit Awards, you know? I mean, we have a lot of history. And yeah. and again, in a Mostly very though, how significant. Do I, look? do I look good? You look really good. Because I don't want to look at myself on this thing, but I want to make sure my angle's all right. Am I all right? Yeah, your angle's great. I don't even want you to cut that out because I, I want people to know <laughs> that you literally are talking to a dude, you know, for like 20 some 30 years who's like insanely vain still. And old, old and vain. Old and vain. Yeah. No, so you look really good. Okay, good. You look good. You'll probably get some dates off this. Really? Yeah. I just want money, man. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, we were engaged. Yeah. I love the idea of marriage. Like, I believe yeah. in that. But after my last yeah. brutal marriage, it yeah. what, what it taught me is that a piece of paper doesn't really mean anything. It doesn't. I, it doesn't I think stop it's like a person go, from lying. Like back in the day, people would be like, yeah, but it makes you stay and it makes you fight it makes through you the hard times. It makes you work on it. And I'm like, I don't want to work on shit. <laughs> like, I just want to work on me. Like, I have the things that I, I need to direct the energy into. Yeah. I share a child with somebody, Sasha. We need to work on our relationship to benefit our child, right? Because I need to work on him with him. I need to work on me, how I, you know, it relates to him and his future. Me having a girlfriend or a wife and like, we're just going like this. It might be just a bad fit, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like I'm not working on like, you know, getting like puzzle pieces to stick together that, don't belong together, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's just, and then you got to go through a divorce and, you know, you lose yeah. half of your, your stuff and you got to, well, it just becomes yeah. so complicated that, you know, I mean, as you know, my parents were married until my dad died. I mean, of course. My yeah. mom still wears her wedding band. Yeah, of course. Um, so I grew up with thinking that that's. It's a different time, though. It is a different time. And I, and, uh, you know, back when they got married, like you married like your classmates, yes. you married somebody like who was down the road from you, you know, you didn't get off the block, you know what I mean? There was no Instagram, there were no options. The world felt so small. And I'm not saying that's a good thing either, by the way. I'm not saying like you should live a life and go like, oh, that was fun. I'm going to go on to the next one, you know, even though plenty of people are out there doing it. But I think that, you know, the world feels in some ways a lot smaller, but you realize the scale of it. And, um, you know, it's probably less likely now that you're going to grind through the hard times with somebody, you know, than 30, 40 years ago, people would do that. Yeah. You know, I'm, again, I'm not saying that you shouldn't grind through the hard times because obviously you have a family. There's a lot at stake, like you're highlighting the divorce is a, a painful process. It's an expensive one. And listen, even I wasn't married to my son's mother. That was a painful breakup. Breaking up with you, we weren't married. That was, that was painful for three fucking years. We, we, had, we were together four plus years. And then I think did three years on and off. Yeah. Like we wouldn't even see us speak to each other for six months, running to each other, be like, oh, you want to live together again? Okay. <laughs> like that's a crazy shit we would do. But, you know, it's hard to move on from really, really deep, meaningful relationships, you know? Um, and, and I, I think, think there's you know, just certain people though, that you, that you stay attracted to like your entire life because right. it goes We're connected beyond, to, for sure, right. right? And it goes yeah. beyond the physical. It's, yeah. it's you know, when, yeah. when two people's brains sort of snap together in that yeah. sense where they really recognize one another and their conversations are always interesting and they can challenge each other a little bit. Right. I think that that's, I don't think it's that easy to find. Right. So there's always that connection. I agree with that. I think that like when you, when you really connect to people on a soul level, you do stay, well, even in friendships, there are certain bonds and connections that are beyond what is tangible to us what, that we could think about in an analytical way. So I, I agree with that, you know, and I don't feel like any relationship I've ever had of length was not without like some impact in a beneficial way for my life. Like, even though your thing is fresh right now, you know, relatively over the last year, you it's know, a year. Yeah. right. But in hindsight, someday you'll look at it. You might still see no benefit. <laughs> that's, 
that's definitely a possibility. But you might see little things you learned about you on the way, <laughs> on the in the you know in the eleven was it eleven years, twelve years. You know, I, you know what? You're right. You because might not. I did you learn. Not, no, but, I, I mean, I already know that yeah. I learned something, which is, you know, I need to listen to my gut and not and not be scared of. Of disrupting things. You mean that people's expectations? Yeah, or, you know, yeah. I mean, I told you before, obviously, we started recording. I said that like the week before the wedding. I got it. But 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 you know what? I spoke to you before the wedding, too. Because he, you something had happened, and you're like, he went home to his parents in Florida, and I, I think I was like, yo, Sean, why don't you just chill the fuck out, get married, and just like, maybe just don't create like a whole issue for once. <laughs> I was like, why don't you just chill out and roll with it? I don't remember exactly, but what I'm saying is. So you're to blame. Okay, like that's, that's where part, I'm going with but this. But I think what I would say, I think what I would say is, and it's tricky because I, I want to figure out how to articulate what I want to say without like. Pissing being me off. Yes, without <laughs> being offensive or insulting. But if you've made some wrong choices before, right? You and don't, I have. right? You don't necessarily know if your instincts taking you to make a bad choice or a good choice. Yeah. So there is one lane in which you're instinctively you could have said to yourself, "I, I shouldn't marry this guy," and really you'd be runaway bride, right? Like. Yeah. You could have been that and you've been like, oh, you, you left behind a good guy. Then your instincts were obviously right because if he did it before, he's going to do it again. It's right. like patterns. Like, and that doesn't apply to everything in life, but it applies to a lot of things in life, you know? So if you go like, this is what he does, it's recidivism, you know? I so, know, but don't you find that interesting that like the week before we were talking, you told me to just go ahead and get married. I don't think it was a week before. I think I just remember at some point you and I had spoke and I was like, like, don't make waves. But I think it was more like you guys were in some kind of state of conflict and he like, you know, ran back to Florida and you're like, he's a pussy or something <laughs> like that, you know? And I was like, I was like, Shant, just chill, man. Just chill. Just go with it, you know? I don't remember the exact scenario, but, you know, it's your story, man. Yeah. It's your story. Yeah. You could have been, got with some other dude and you'd be like, oh, yeah, I'm going, you know, he's a cop, the pilot and crashed in, God forbid, knock him one into what, like anything can happen at any time. There's just no guarantees. That's the thing about relationships. Like, I think most people probably wake up one day and don't know who the it's been laying next to him for like <laughs> 10 years. They're like, who is this guy? Who is this girl? Who is this person? Yeah, who are they? Like, people change. They evolve. Like, you take your eye off the ball for a second, the ball's somewhere else, yeah. man. You know? And it's like, and then even worse is like, the people who are, don't even give each other room to breathe. They never take the eye off the ball, you know? Like, I know like couples that are like that. And you're just like, holy shit, you know? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if that's healthier or it feels unhealthy because you're having to be so attentive to that relationship and to that person that I would imagine that sometimes you would lose yourself in it a little bit. I just know that going back to what you were saying about like the grind and marriage for me now, I don't want to do like the grind anymore in my life because I think it's one of the beautiful things that cancer has really taught me is to appreciate the peace appreciate course, right, the fact right. that even though my life is disrupted to a certain degree just from cancer and treatments and all of that it uh has brought me so much knowledge and and changed me drastically as a human being changed right. me into a person that now really appreciates calm yeah and appreciates that peace and looks at certain situations or certain people and I now say, like, uh, like that's not worth it. It's not worth right. my peace of mind. It's not worth the disruption in my life. And that's not for everyone, right? I mean, obviously, thank God my parents were so dedicated to each other right. and, and stayed together. And they definitely went on a bit of a grind throughout their marriage at times, as everyone right. does. So I think it's beautiful that some people can do it. I just know that for me, I can't do it anymore. And it doesn't yeah. mean I don't First want all, I would a relationship. Never say, I would never say that I couldn't do it. I don't think that I have ever personally dreamed of my wedding day. That's just me. 
like the commitment to another human, I'm totally cool with that, man. Like I, I'm, I'm like, I like like, you know, when I'm in a relationship to be in a relationship, when I'm single, I like to feel single, you know, yeah. like I try to embrace where I'm at, but the idea of marriage just always felt like antiquated to me. It just did. Like my son's mother is the single most, we were only together. We dated for three years, me and my son's mother. She's the single most important woman to me on the planet. Mm -hmm. She is the mother of my child. Mm -hmm. There is no woman that I'm going to date that's going to be more important unless I have a kid with her. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just, it's just the way it is. Like I didn't need to marry her to know and recognize her value to me, you know? So, I mean, I sound like I'm really making a lot of excuses to not get married again. But by the way, if I like fell madly in love with somebody who was important to them, great, you know what right. I mean? But I, I'm not young anymore. So a lot of these things that you mistake even as love and like times where we could be like, oh, we love each other so much it's painful. How much of that's love? You know, supposedly love is egoless. How much of it's codependency? How You know what I mean? There's so many other factors yeah. in life that play into what you feel and what you think you need that, you know, the evidence that I had and have love for you is the fact that I'm sitting here doing this with you. Right. That, you know, we broke up 20 some odd years ago. And there's never been a day where, like, where I wouldn't take your back. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, that's just, that's the reality. And and I'm not the only ex you have that feels that way, because I know Rick feels that way about mm -hmm. you, too. So, I don't know about all the other exes, but, probably, you know. They probably but, don't but I know me way. and Rick feel that way, so, <laughs> Well, and you, you know. guys are really the, you know, I was telling you earlier that Les Need was on the podcast, and we have categories that he uses for when he drafts, right? right? And one of those categories was like buyer beware. Right. And another one, which is obviously the lowest one. And then the highest one is a math changer. Like somebody who um, really comes in and changes things. Like right. that player that you really, really want. Right. And, and I said that you were the math changer. I was like, Rob was always a math changer. Like he was just you know, yes, we were young and there were some mistakes made here and there, but you were the math changer. I, I think you still are. And then Rick, who you obviously know, I still adore. Right, I love right. him. He loves yeah, me. Yeah. Just like our relationship. Yeah. He was in the buyer beware right, category. Right, right. Well, he has different demons than me. You know what I mean? He's a solid cat. And he's it, solid. Like, I mean, but he's just Yeah, he's, he's just a guy's different... guy too. You yeah. know, there's, there's a lot to like about Rick. I, again, I don't know him super, super well, but every exchange I've ever had with the guy, I crack up. I think he's dope. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we all bring something to the table of a relationship, and that is yeah. ourselves for good and bad and you know, and, and but it's also what you learn from the other person, right? I right. mean, sometimes it's just what you learn you. by like proxy, right? Like what you see, what I see you go through, what you see me going through, you know, how I deal with that versus how you might deal with it. Right. We, we get to have these experiences that are kind of shared, even if they're not really both people's experiences, right. you know, it's like, um, it's, in, I mean, some of the biggest lessons of my life, I think, we're watching things happen to other people. You know, it's like my dad, my dad passed away too. Ironically, I didn't even tell you this, but I Dr. Chu took out my dad's brain tumor. Really? Yeah. And I love that guy. He was awesome. But, but, you know, watching that year of what my dad was going through taught me about life. You know what I mean? Mostly about mortality and, and how to look at that, you know? But it's, your dad was a little bit like my dad in the right. sense of like these big guys Right. Who you just thought they were like indestructible. I mean, they were right. and and sort of larger than life in a way. Your dad right. was definitely different, larger different, than life. They they were they were old school East Coast dudes. Yes. Your dad was a Jersey guy, my dad a Brooklyn guy. I mean, they were, you know, the, they were Get over here, kid. Like yeah. your dad always. My dad used to would probably certainly be and I mean again, I love my dad, I miss him. He was, a, you know, he was, he served in the military. He was definitely a tougher street cat, but he would 100% be categorized as toxic male. <laughs> not, not even a doubt, you know, by today's like criteria. 100% he, he was like straight up and cigarette smoker. I'll never quit until, you know, he had lung cancer. And I go, dad, you want a cigarette? I'll never smoke a 
smoking a cigarette again as long as I live. But, you know, they were a different breed of man that were that was born in the 40s, 50s. It was just different. Everything's different, you know, and it's like. I loved him so much. When I saw him at the hospital, it was like. He was so, uh, he started to cry when you showed up. Yeah. He was like, yeah, it was, it was. That'll make me cry. Just talking about your dad and showing up at the hospital. Hey man, I was, was yeah, I remember being at your dad's funeral and then you see me and starting to cry. And and it was like heavy, man. We've been through a lot together. Well, that, but that's the amazing thing about love and friendship and and history with each other. It's like, you know, the times to pop in and out, you know Mm -hmm. I mean? Even when you said, hey, would you come on the pod? I was like, of course I'd come on your podcast. You're like, really? I'm like, yeah, of course. I mean, you know, why wouldn't I? You know, so. Yeah, I mean, it's not like Don't I want. Don't make me get like, up and hug you right here on the podcast. <laughs> just, I'm crying. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's not like I would have every, you know, ex on, but right. Like you and Rick are significant to me, right. and also because I still adore both of you, and I still always I walk away from either a phone conversation or seeing you in person with something different. It, it, right. whether I've learned something or a new feeling or I always view things as like, we have these little invisible strings, right? Right. That sort of stretch out forever. And when you find someone that you connect with on that soul level that we were talking about, that string always stays there. Maybe it's not as thick as it was, right. but it's always, you're still always tethered together in some way, of shape course, or form. Of course. So by the way, before I forget this, for the people listening who were always asking where my Prue wore a diamond heart necklace. You guys, the diamond heart necklace on Charmed that Prue wore was a gift from Rob. Do you want to know the craziest thing? I was at Equinox. They, for whatever reason, at the times I'm in there in the morning, they're running Charmed. And, I, and this is maybe a couple of weeks ago. And I was watching you and I saw that necklace and I was like, Oh, I gave her that fucking necklace. Yeah, like, it's I downstairs. Remember. Yeah, it's, it's in my jewelry crazy. box. I still have it's it. It's so crazy. Yeah. There's somebody on Instagram who breaks down um, all of like the wardrobe from the show really? each episode, well, yeah. and and she keeps on mentioning the diamond heart. That's cool, necklace. man. That's cool. You still have that. I have like some things you gave me too uh, that I think I actually cleaned them like a year ago. Like there was just some like really cool silver necklaces and rings, and it's kind of you know I don't really wear much jewelry, but you know. No. It is kind of funny that I've always tattoos. You had a tattoo with my name on it that you covered up with a bunch of flowers, which totally, by the way, I, I thought it was crazy. You got my name to begin with. So I was like, yeah, because you, didn't get, like, you didn't get my She's, name. Right, exactly. I didn't get your name. I didn't have tattoos. And back then you probably were like, get my name. And I was like, nah, baby, I'm a Jew. I can't do that. <laughs> my dad, my dad would have fucking sh- but nobody could tell, but I'm I know, fully, but now you're like I'm fully tatted. sleeved on like both arms, my chest, you know? So if we had been together, Back then, I'd probably have like a giant Shannon across my neck or something, you know? It's never too late, Rob. Maybe. You know what? It's never too late. You know what? I might, I, might, I, I could potentially get a portrait, you know? I mean, just... And they'd be like, yo, bro, why do you have the 902 and <laughs> girl on your back, you know? <laughs> do, do you have any yeah. space on your back yeah. left? My back is empty. I oh. Just, it started, I got my son's name when my son was born, and I put like a little diamond over it as like a, like symbolism for his mom which is just a funny story anyway 
Like she would do stuff like, and I'd be like, oh, this girl's such a gem. Like, but I would mean it kind of quasi sarcastically. And then it actually stuck as her nickname in a loving way where I'd be like, she's the gem. She's the gem, right? So I put like the diamond for her because I've never put anybody's names on me. Just Carlito, like I have for my son, right? And then, then my dog died. Then Moses died. The story I told you about pre thing where, you know, so then I put his portrait so then I'm like, I had the two of them, and Mr. Cartoon is a very well-known tattoo artist, did them. And I was going to him, and I was going to, like, join them together. I don't even know what I was thinking. But as I'm driving there, I'm like, wait, I got, like, the, one of the most famous tattoo artists in the world, and I keep doing things on my chest where nobody could see him. So I was like, hey, man, what do, you, what do you think about doing something on the arm? And he was like, yo, the arm is prime real estate for a tattoo artist. So they start the arm, and once you start the arm, you start looking at it, you're like, Oh, it I needs need more. to do more. Mm -hmm. So then I did the whole arm with multiple things. Everything on there means something to me. And then I would look in the mirror and I'd be like, oh, one sleeve is so weird. Like my brain is crazy. So then I started this sleeve and it's pretty much done. Right. You wanted like symmetry in, in it. Yeah. That's that makes the sense problem with this. It's like, it's par partially addic ad ad addictive. It is addictive. It's addictive, but it's also partially designed where you're like something's not right but if it ain't right like you got a problem because yeah. you're like covering shit up or try, you know it's not like you can move it around but you know anyway i don't know i want i mean i want one like right down my side really but, well yeah, yeah i've been wanting it for I, my dad's name and like oh i got the guys dates. to do it i have such great guys to like do that stuff i now. just i'm like yeah it's all right i don't need it it's also once you get you know i'm like i can't get infections like there's a whole not that you're going to get yeah. something from a tattoo artist. Well, I wasn't going to take you like some like alley <laughs> tattoo parlor, you know? I'm like, yeah, my friend's great. He does it, he does it, he does it out of the back of his fucking surf wagon on Venice Beach. No, uh, I take you. I have friends with like great, great. Um, I mean, my tattoo now looks like, um, it looks like an anchor. So I look really? like a Popeye. Oh, that's right. Because you had the thing underneath and you had the cross. Exactly. And then I have to put the band of flowers to cover that's your right. name. Yeah, so yeah, I, yeah. it looks like an yeah. anchor. It's yeah. so embarrassing. It's I try to wear hysterical. pants most of the time. So what that, do you mean? It probably looks great if you got a sailor outfit on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, throw on like one of these like little navy shirts. No, with it's the good cap. for Halloween yeah. when yeah. I when I'm dressed as Popeye. Yeah, oh, you're adorable. You're fine. You, you could afford the bad tattoo. Um, I'm going to ask you a really hard question. You don't have to answer it. What do you think was sort of our greatest moment? Our greatest I mean, moment really as hard. a couple? Yeah, as a couple. Like, what time period? I mean, I know. Uh, you know what this weird thing just flashed in? <laughs> I don't even know where this came from. Like, I, I don't know about great moments, us at our best. But I remember... You and me, and I have no idea why this memory just popped into my head the minute you asked me that. You and me were in Venice, Italy. It was late at night. You were like, let's go get something to eat. Wherever we were staying, I don't know why we couldn't just order something to the room, but you were like, let's go get something to eat. And for whatever reason, the streets were dead, right? And we started walking, and we're walking down like kind of cobblestone, narrow streets. And some guy was like, started to talk to us. But I, I don't remember, like, if he even, like, he like, knew very little English. He's like, oh, we want food. This day. He's, like, he's like, yeah, come this way. So we start walking. Then another guy kind of comes out. That guy starts speaking to that guy in Italian. I don't understand what they're saying. That guy starts following us. One guy's leading us. One guy's following us. Nobody else is around. I don't remember if there was a third guy, but there were definitely the two guys. There was guys. a third guy. There was a third guy. Yeah. And you look at me, you go, we're definitely getting rolled. <laughs> and I go like this, I go, I go, what? And you go, we'll get get rolled or something like that. And I'm like, holy shit, we're getting robbed in Venice by like these three dudes that like we can't communicate with. So I'm like, all right. But it was like you and me in this like crazy little, what are we going to do? Kind of Bonnie and Clyde-esque, except, you know, back then I was probably like so fucking neurotic. I was like, oh my God, what are we going to do? <laughs> this is crazy. So I remember we follow this kid and we think, all right, well, what's the plan? What's the plan? What's the plan? And then all of a sudden a restaurant appeared. It was like the only like 24 hour. And it was hour, delicious. Yeah. And it was like the only yeah. 24 hour restaurant thing that was like mm -hmm. open. But I don't know, man, we had like some fun, cool shit, like, you know, road trips and like, I mean, I, like we had fun. I mean, we definitely had bad moments like where we would go to war. 
But we had good lovey moments too, you know? And I mean, there was just a lot of good stuff. You I know? like, I love that whole, you know, the whole sort of Europe trip. Well, the best is we got there. And so, again, we, I think we have to reiterate that, but we were super young at that time. We we're like still 20s. So they were like, hey, we're going to go to Europe and rough it. We're getting on a budget. Yeah. And you're like, do you guys want to go? And you were like, I'm going. You're coming. And I was like, I'm not going on this trip. You're like, I'll get you some chrome hearts if you come. And I was like, remember that? Yep. And I was like, all right, fuck it, I'm in, right? You know, so <laughs> all it took was the fashion chrome whore that I am or whatever. <laughs> So I, um, so we go there and we go to Amsterdam and like, we're in like a youth hostel with five. I remember we get in there and there's five beds in a room and you're like, nah, bro, no. <laughs> and you just like, all of a sudden you're flipping the whole trip around. All of a sudden we're in like the sickest fucking places, but that was you, man. You were like a boss back then. Like now everybody's famous at that time. Like. You were easily one of the more famous faces on the planet at yeah. that time, you know? So it was like going anywhere. Like, in hindsight, those three guys were probably saying, you know, it's the girl from 90210. Right. Yeah. And they were like, oh, shit, oh, shit. But, like, we didn't know that. But but you got that sense, And you Europe know? was, like, huge for me. Like, people in Europe yeah, loved I remember, me. Yes, because you went when we first started dating and I didn't go. And you were set, like you had these videos that were insane in Italy where people were like, Outside the hotel, and you know, you guys were global, like you know, the, the 90210 cast. 